Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends, I welcome you to the 11th lecture of our course ADR and Arbitration. This session is on jurisdiction of arbitral tribunal. But before we start this session, let me go back to whatever we have discussed in arbitration. We introduced the idea of arbitration agreement, section 7. I, I discussed section 8, power of judicial authority to refer the matter for arbitration. We talked about composition of arbitral tribunal. Section 10 talks about number of arbitrators. Section 11 talks about procedure to appoint arbitrators. And in the last class, if you remember, we were talking about uh, sections 12 to 15, in which we discussed as to how can we challenge an arbitrator? What are the grounds to challenge an arbitrator? What is the procedure to challenge an arbitrator? And once the arbitrator is successfully challenged, then what is the procedure to find a replacement? The replacement is to be found according to section 15. So what we have done so far is we have covered all the sections up to section 15. Of course, I have not discussed section 9, which we will take up maybe in the next lecture. Now, after having done the composition, the next thing is to understand the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal. Jurisdiction of arbitral tribunal means there are two sections which we have in this chapter. One is section 16, the other is 17. Now, after this lecture, I am sure you will be in a position to understand things like uh, the principle of competence, competence and the power of arbitral tribunal to pass interim measures. I will also talk about the concept of emergency award or the concept of emergency arbitrator proceeding. So this is what I propose to discuss in this lecture. This is a session on jurisdiction of arbitral tribunal. Now the first thing is the word jurisdiction. This word has not been defined. But what we may include in the word jurisdiction, there are three things which I have listed here. One whether there is a valid agreement is to be decided by the arbitral tribunal. Whether there is a valid agreement is to be decided by the arbitral tribunal. What are the criteria to determine validity of an arbitration agreement? Whether there is consensus ad item? Whether there, uh, the requirements of section 7 have been fulfilled? Whether the requirements which have emerged because of various case laws like KK Modi versus KN Modi have been fulfilled? whether the consent of the parties is our free consent, whether the consent is influenced by force, fraud, coercion, undue influence. So what I'm trying to say, all the principles of uh, Contract Act 1872 shall be used to examine whether there is a valid agreement in question and it shall be the responsibility of the tribunal under section 16 to decide the validity. We will talk more about the question of validity later on. So the first question within the term, first point within the term jurisdiction is determination of validity of arbitration agreement. Second, the tribunal has to decide whether the tribunal has been properly constituted. And if you recall, we have discussed the composition part from section 10 to 15, whether the requirements of section 10 that it must not, the number of arbitrators must not be even have been followed, whether the procedure mentioned in section 11 for appointment has been followed, if there is a challenge whether the substitute has been appointed according to section 15 has been followed. So therefore, validity of composition of the tribunal is to be decided by the tribunal itself. And third point, whether matters have been submitted to arbitration in accordance with the arbitration agreement. So the arbitration agreement must provide for a submission agreement also. Every arbitration agreement must contemplate a submission agreement. We have discussed this point. So whether the submission of the dispute to the tribunal is made according to arbitration agreement is also a question to be determined by the arbitral tribunal. 
So there are three points which we can include in the term uh, competence or jurisdiction. One, to decide validity of agreement. Two, to decide whether the composition is validly created or not. And three, whether the reference is validly done according to the arbitration agreement or not. Now, it is the competence of the arbitral tribunal to decide its competence, which we find in section 16. It is the competence of the arbitral tribunal to rule on its competence, which is called as the principle of competence competence. Under French law, it is called as competence de la competence. And it is a universally accepted principle which has been incorporated in section 16 of your act. We will read the provision, but before that, I may tell you that section 16 incorporates two principles. First is the principle of competence, competence, that is jurisdiction of the tribunal to rule on its jurisdiction. And second principle is called as autonomy of arbitration clause. It can also be called as doctrine of separability. It can also be called as survival of arbitration clause. What do I mean by that? If you remember, I said arbitration agreement can be part of the main contract. It can be there in the form of a separate agreement. Whether it is part of the main contract or whether it is there in the form of separate agreement, it remains a distinct document. And termination of main contract will not automatically mean termination of arbitration clause. What I am saying, even if your arbitration clause is part of the main contract, it has its independent existence and termination of main contract will not affect the validity of the arbitration clause. So arbitration clause survives the termination of main contract. Therefore, it is called survival of arbitration clause. Therefore, it is called autonomy of arbitration clause. These two principles, competence, competence and autonomy of arbitration clause find place in section 16. So that is what we will discuss jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal to rule on its jurisdiction. Let us take the first principle that is competence, competence. This doctrine has two clear aspects. The first aspect confirms to the arbitrators that they may decide on their jurisdiction without need for support from the court. So it is for the tribunal to decide on their jurisdiction without getting any help from court. This is the first aspect that tribunal has to decide the jurisdiction. The second aspect is that court is prevented from determining this question unless tribunal has done it for the first time. So first aspect ensures that tribunal decides the jurisdiction. Second aspect prevents courts or judicial authority from determining the issue before the tribunal has decided it. In addition to these, there may be one more aspect to the doctrine of competence, competence that is in case a judicial authority is seized prematurely of the issue of arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction, it has to confine itself to find that there exists an arbitration agreement, nothing more, nothing less. I will explain it more. I said the doctrine of competence, competence has two clearly identified aspects. One ensures that the arbitral tribunal has to decide the jurisdiction before any aid from any other court or judicial authority. The second aspect is that no court shall decide the jurisdiction unless the arbitral tribunal has decided the question. So it is a rule of chronological priority. First of all, jurisdiction has to be decided by the tribunal itself. Then it can be a matter of review by the court. That is a different thing. So there is a chronology. First of all, it has to be decided by the arbitral tribunal itself. Initially and primarily, it is the responsibility of the arbitral tribunal itself to determine whether it has jurisdiction in a given case or not. As I said, subsequent review is possible. But suppose in case there is a situation where a judicial authority or a court gets an opportunity before the tribunal has decided this question, 
then what should that judicial authority or court do? The principles say that in such a situation where a court prematurely gets an opportunity, it must not get into the question of deciding the jurisdiction of the tribunal. It should only see whether there exists an arbitration agreement and leave this question of determining jurisdiction to the tribunal to be decided. Therefore, I said it is a rule of chronological priority and initially and primarily it is for the arbitral tribunal itself to determine whether it has jurisdiction in the matter subject to ultimate court control. So there are two points I said. First is competence, competence, which has got two aspects. The second is autonomy of arbitration agreement. There is a query, there is a doubt as to what is the source of power of an arbitral tribunal. From where does arbitral tribunal get its powers? If arbitral tribunal gets powers from arbitration agreement, then deriving authority from arbitration agreement, can that tribunal declare that the same agreement is invalid? Try and understand. If the source of, source of power of arbitral tribunal is arbitration agreement, deriving authority from arbitration agreement itself, can the tribunal declare that agreement to be invalid? No, because the moment it declares that agreement to be invalid, the very existence of arbitral tribunal comes under scanner. Because if we are saying that tribunal is getting powers from agreement and agreement is declared invalid, the power of the tribunal also goes along with that agreement. So therefore, we cannot conclude that arbitral tribunal gets its powers from arbitration agreement. The source of power of arbitral tribunal to declare an agreement to be valid or invalid is not agreement. It is actually section 16 which incorporates the principle of competence, competence. I hope you understand this point. Section 16 empowers the arbitral tribunal to rule on its jurisdiction. It is the section 16 which empowers the arbitral tribunal to decide the validity of arbitration agreement and the Tribunal is not deriving powers from arbitration agreement to declare whether the agreement is valid or not. Now, let us see what section 16 provides for. Section 16 clause 1 says that arbitral tribunal may rule on its own jurisdiction, including ruling on any objections with respect to existence or validity of the arbitration agreement. So therefore, there are two things which we have already discussed. One, tribunal will rule on its jurisdiction and second, tribunal will decide the validity of arbitration agreement. And for that purpose, there are two clauses. Clause A says, an arbitration clause which forms part of a contract shall be treated as an agreement independent of the other terms of the contract. This is survival of arbitration clause. This is autonomy of arbitration clause. That means an arbitration clause, even if it is part of the main contract, shall be considered as different from the main contract. Second, a decision by the tribunal that the contract is null and void shall not entail ipso jure the invalidity of arbitration clause. So therefore, if the tribunal decides that the main contract is null and void, that will not automatically mean that arbitration clause is also null and void. This is what we have in section 16.1. These are the two principles which I discussed, which I explained. Subsection 2 says that a plea that arbitral tribunal does not have jurisdiction shall be raised not later than the submission of the statement of defense. If you recall, we have discussed this point while discussing section 10 also, where I said that the objection that a particular arbitral tribunal does not have jurisdiction must be raised by a party before submitting on, on merits of the case. So before submitting my statement of defense, I am obliged to raise the issue of lack of jurisdiction. However, a party shall not be precluded from raising such a plea merely because that he has appointed or participated in the appointment of an arbitrator. So therefore, if I fail to raise my objection 
before submitting my statement of defense, then section 4 will come in play and it will be it will be assumed that I have waived my right to object. Because if a timeline has been prescribed to raise an objection, I am expected to raise my objection within that timeline. Section 16.2 identifies a timeline. It says that before submitting my defense, I have to raise the issue of lack of jurisdiction. But if I fail to do that, it means I am willing to waive my right to object. It further says that, I have the right to object even if I have participated in the appointment of arbitrators. So simply because I have also participated in the appointment of arbitrators, I am not precluded from raising the objection as regards lack of jurisdiction of that arbitral tribunal. Subsection 3 says a plea that the arbitral tribunal is exceeding the scope of its authority. Now see here, the previous subsection was where I am raising an objection regarding lack of jurisdiction. Subsection 3 is when the tribunal was within jurisdiction, but during the proceedings, it exceeded its jurisdiction. Now, in this situation, an, an objection in a situation where the tribunal is exceeding its jurisdiction must be raised as soon as the matter comes to my knowledge. So, as soon as the matter comes to my knowledge, this is again a timeline. As soon as the matter comes to my knowledge that tribunal is exceeding his jurisdiction, I am obliged to raise my objection immediately. And again, I may say that if I fail to raise my objection immediately, as soon as I, I, I come to know about the tribunal exceeding jurisdiction, then again section 4 will come in play and it is deemed to have been waived by me. What is, what is waived by me? The right to raise an objection is deemed to have been waived by me. Subsection 4 says the arbitral tribunal may extend the time within which you can raise an objection if there is justification for delay in raising the objection. Subsection 5 says that when your objection to lack of jurisdiction is rejected, there are two alternatives. Your, your plea that tribunal does not have jurisdiction can be accepted, can be rejected. If it is rejected, then tribunal will continue the proceedings. If it is rejected, the tribunal will continue the proceeding. But if the objection is accepted, the tribunal has to stop the proceeding then and there. Now, when the tribunal stops the proceeding, there is an immediate review under section 37 of the act. The other party can go to the court in section 37 and say that the decision taken by the tribunal as regards the objection of lack of jurisdiction is wrong. But in case the objection of lack of jurisdiction is rejected and tribunal continues, you do not have an immediate relief. There is no appeal in section 37. In that case, subsection 6 says that the aggrieved party will have to wait till the time an award is passed and the aggrieved party can challenge this award in section 34 on the ground that tribunal has wrongly decided the jurisdictional question. Let me summarize once again. You have a timeline within which you must raise the objection as regards lack of jurisdiction, point number one. Second, in case tribunal exceeds its jurisdiction, you must raise it immediately once you come to know about it. If you fail to do it, then in both these situations, section 4 will come into play and it is deemed to have been waived by you. You have waived your right to object. Subsection 4 says that in case the delay in raising the objection can be justified, if you can give a, just, a, a good reason for delay and, and, and the tribunal is satisfied, it may extend the period within which you can raise the objection. Subsection 5 is crucial. It says if your objection is accepted, then tribunal will stop functioning. The other party can immediately file an appeal in section 37. Whereas, if your objection is rejected, tribunal will continue and the other party does not have an immediate relief. On this point, there was a challenge in the year 2000, there was a case filed called as Baba Ali versus Union of India, in which the allegation was that section 16 is discriminatory. It violates article 14 of Indian constitution because when it accepts your objection and stops the proceedings, you have a relief when in case it rejects your objection, 
and continues with the proceeding, you don't have a relief. This objection was not entertained, was not accepted by the court in that case of Babar Ali versus Union of India. Court turned down the argument and said that the act is constitutionally valid. The only difference is you have an immediate relief in one situation. In the second situation, the relief is slightly delayed. It is not that there is no review of this decision. The only thing is, in case the arbitration continues, you will have to wait till the time an award is passed. And it is only once the award is passed that you can challenge this award under Section 34 on the ground that the jurisdictional question was wrongly decided and tribunal never had the jurisdiction to decide the case. So this is one part of our discussion, which is about Section 16, which is about the principle of competence, competence, which means jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal to rule on its jurisdiction. It also includes the aspect of determining validity of the arbitration agreement. I said it is for the tribunal to decide the validity of arbitration agreement. It's the rule of chronological priority. And unless tribunal has decided, no other forum can decide the validity. But unfortunately, if you recall, we have discussed in sections 8 and 11, the, the, we, had, we had a mechanism in which under section 8, prior to 2015 amendment of the act, under section 8, judicial authority used to decide validity of the arbitration agreement. Similarly, in section 11, the Chief Justice of India or Chief Justice of Concern High Court used to decide validity of arbitration agreement. If you remember the case of SBP Company versus Patel Engineering. And once it has been decided by the judicial authority in section 8 or by the Chief Justice in section 11, then tribunal is not going to reopen that question. So the meaning was once these questions have already been decided, Tribunal does not have the jurisdiction to decide that question again. So 8 and 11 had the impact on 16. Scope of competence, competence was narrowed down because of the interpretations given to section 11 and section 8. Then 2015 amendment came. We have discussed these issues in details. 2015 amendment came in section 8. Now, when the judicial authority has to decide whether the matter is to be referred for arbitration or not. Judicial authority will not decide the validity of arbitration agreement. It will only decide prima facie validity. In section 11, before appointing an arbitrator, the, the, the Supreme Court or the High Court, as the case may be, will not decide validity of arbitration agreement. It will only see prima facie existence of an agreement. So to a great extent, the problem which we had in 8 and 11 has been cured. And to a great extent, the scope of Section 16 has been preserved now after the 2015 amendment of the Act. So this is one part of the discussion. We are talking about the power of arbitral tribunal. The first aspect is Section 16. The second aspect is Section 17. Section 17 is interim measures ordered by tribunal. Section 17 provides for power of the tribunal to pass interim measures. Section 9, we will talk about it later on. Section 9 talks about power of the court to pass interim measures. Section 17 talks about power of tribunal to pass interim measures. And we are not using the word interim award, mind. We are not talking about power of the tribunal to pass interim award. We are talking about power of tribunal to pass interim measures. Now, prior to 2015 amendment, the law was entirely different. Section 17 has been substantially modified in 2015 amendment. We'll first see what it was prior to 2015. Before 2015, Section 17 provided that unless otherwise agreed by the parties. Now, this phrase is important. You will find this phrase in many of the provisions in our Act. This phrase suggests that the provision is subject to party autonomy. Unless otherwise agreed by the parties, the arbitral tribunal may, at the request of a party, order a party to take an interim measure of protection as the arbitral tribunal may consider necessary in respect of the subject matter of the dispute. So, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, the arbitral tribunal had the jurisdiction to pass interim measures 
interim measure for protection of the subject matter of the dispute. But this was subject to party autonomy as I said. That means parties can always exclude application of section 17. Parties can agree otherwise. Parties can agree that tribunal will not have this power in our case. So it is not a mandatory provision. It is not that tribunal will always have this power. It depends on the agreement between the parties. If parties do not exclude application of section 17, then tribunal will have the power to pass interim measures. So the first limitation of section 17 prior to 2015 amendment was that it was subject to party autonomy. Parties could exclude application of section 17. The second, if you see, 17.1 says, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, the arbitral tribunal may at the request of a party. Any party could request the tribunal to pass an interim measure. Any party could request the tribunal to pass an interim measure. Request means it can be oral request also. So there was no necessity to file an application. It does not say that the arbitral tribunal may on an application of a party. It does not say so. It says the arbitral tribunal may at the request of a party. So therefore, 17 could be invoked on request. 17 therefore could be invoked orally also during the proceedings. My Lord, kindly grant me this interim measure and the, the arbitrator may agree to grant you that interim measure. So it, it could be invoked orally also. 17 could be invoked only during the proceedings. Obviously, during the proceeding, you have the tribunal in existence. So, 17 could be invoked during the proceedings. There were many limitations in unamended section 17. The range of orders which could be issued by the arbitral tribunal were very limited. Arbitral tribunal could not order something which is going to bind non-parties. Because arbitration is a private dispute resolution mechanism between the parties. And a tribunal empowered by the parties to decide their dispute cannot affect non-parties. So it never had the power to affect non-parties. Certain measures could only be granted by a court. So 9 always remains relevant. 9 which is used to get interim measure by a court always remains relevant because Certain orders could be passed only by the court, not by the tribunal. And the biggest problem with respect to unamended section 17 was that the order passed under section 17 by the arbitral tribunal lacked enforceability. In the beginning itself, I said that tribunal was empowered to pass interim measures, not interim award. Had it been interim award, we could have enforced it as any other award under section 36. Award, the definition of award includes interim awards. Had it been interim award, we could have enforced it by the mechanism of this act. But the order passed in section 17 is not an interim award, it is an interim measure and therefore there was no mechanism to enforce it. So it only had persuasive value. Then in 2009, Delhi High Court decides two cases. One is Sri Krishan versus Anand, and the other is India Bulls Financial Services versus Jubilee Plots. These two cases were decided in the context of the point of lack of enforceability, which I just mentioned. Delhi High Court held that any person who fails to comply with the interim measure passed by the arbitral tribunal under Section 17 is making any other default. Now, there are two phrases which you see in the slide here. Delhi High Court in these two cases of 2009 said, anybody who is not complying with the interim measure passed by an arbitral tribunal under section 17 is making any other default or is guilty of any contempt to the arbitral tribunal during the conduct of the arbitral proceedings. So the person who is not complying with the order passed by the arbitral tribunal in section 17 is committing a default or he is guilty of 
contempt of arbitral tribunal. These two wrongs have been mentioned in section 27.5. According to section 27.5, anybody who is making any default or anybody who is guilty of any contempt to the arbitral tribunal will have to face consequences. Now, what Delhi High Court does, it says that if anyone is not complying with the interim measure passed by the arbitral tribunal, it is as bad as contempt of arbitral tribunal. And if it is contempt of arbitral tribunal or if it amounts to making of any other default, then in that case, section 27, subsection 5 provides for consequences. And therefore, the relief is that the aggrieved party will make a representation to the court, will request the tribunal to make a representation to the court to meet out appropriate punishment to the defaulter. Now, there was a point that arbitral tribunals interim measures lack enforceability that was cured by Delhi High Court by way of these two judgments in which Delhi High Court clarified that if somebody is not complying with the interim measures, it amounts to contempt of arbitral tribunal and therefore now the remedy for the aggrieved person is to apply to the tribunal to make a representation to the court so that court will meet out appropriate punishment to the default. There are many defects which I identified. A tribunal could not compel a non-party to appear before it. The range of orders which tribunal could pass was very limited. It lacked enforceability. Of course, after 2009, the problem of lack of enforceability was cured. Then came 2015 amendment, which modified section 17 in a very substantial way. The new section 17 is not subject to party autonomy. That means now parties cannot exclude application of section 17. It has become a mandatory provision. Second, the new section 17 has to be invoked by way of an application. So it cannot be invoked orally any, anymore. It can be invoked during the proceeding. Listen to me carefully. It can be invoked during the proceeding even after the award is passed, but before it is enforced. This was a significant change. Prior to 2015, Section 17 could be used only during the proceeding. After the amendment, it could, it, it, it could be used during the proceeding, even after the award is passed, but before it is enforced. Now, this second part, even if even after the award is passed but before it is enforced, was dropped in the year 2009, you see. The first stage in which it can be invoked is during the proceeding and second stage, even after the award is passed before it is enforced, this second stage is dropped in the year 2019. An amendment was done in 2019 and this part was deleted, omitted. Why? Because there were practical difficulties. Once a final award is passed, section 32 of your act says, once the final award is passed, the tribunal becomes defunct. How can a defunct tribunal pass interim measures after passing the final award? So therefore, this provision requires that the mandate of tribunal is revived. Try and understand. During the proceedings, a tribunal could pass interim measures, fine. Once the award is passed, the tribunal becomes defunct according to section 32. Now, under section 17, how can this tribunal, which has already become defunct, pass an interim measure? Because it is no more there. If we want this tribunal to remain alive so as to pass interim measure even beyond passing the final award, then we will have to revive the mandate of the tribunal, which we did not do in section 17. We did not say that for the purposes of passing interim measures, after the award is passed, the mandate of tribunal is revived. We have not said though, so that. Therefore, this part was not acceptable. Further, 
the part said that the interim measure could be passed after the award is passed, but before it could be enforced. Now, this is a long duration. Limitation period for enforcement of an arbitral award is 12 years. So, for 12 years, you are expecting the tribunal to remain alive and see if an interim measure is required. That is a fairly long time period for parties to maintain an arbitral tribunal. Realizing these two difficulties, Parliament dropped this part in 2019 amendment of Section 17. And after now, after the amendment now, Section 17 can be invoked only during the proceedings. New Section 17, subsection 2 says that order passed under this section shall be deemed to be an order passed by a court and therefore it is enforceable under CPC 1908. So, the biggest problem which we had in relation to section 17 that the interim measures passed by section 16 did not have enforceability that has been completely cured and now the orders passed by arbitral tribunal in section 16 are enforceable like any other order of a court under code of civil procedure 1908. So, we have come to the third part now. First was section 16 competence competence. Second was section 17, the power of arbitral tribunal to pass interim measures. We saw how prior to 2015, there was limited scope for the arbitral tribunal to pass interim measures. And how after 2015, the scope of this power was expanded. The list of orders which can now be passed by arbitral tribunal is, is as good as the list of orders which can be passed by a court. Section 17 says that for the purpose of passing interim measure, arbitral tribunal is deemed to be a court. So, it does not lack enforceability. Orders passed by arbitral tribunal are as good as decree of a court enforceable under CPC. So, the entire complexion of section 17 has changed. We also discussed how 17 was modified again in 2019 to cure the defect which came in 2015 amendment. I hope you understand these points. There is one more aspect connected with section 17 that is called emergency arbitrator proceeding. We have been saying that arbitral tribunal has the power to pass interim measure during the proceeding. Now, there are two stages where we may require indulgence of some authority so that interest of one party is not jeopardized. One, before the commencement of arbitral proceeding. You and me enter into a contract, there is an arbitration clause that in case a dispute arises, we will refer the matter for arbitration. A dispute arose. Now, section 21 of the act says, section 21 of Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996 says that arbitration proceeding commences on the day when the respondent receives the notice of arbitration. Now, I am sending a notice to the respondent that look, there is a dispute in place and I want this dispute to be referred for arbitration. Let us start arbitration. I am invoking the arbitration clause. Now, this notice has to be received by the respondent. Once the notice is received by the respondent, arbitration commences. But mind, the tribunal has not come into existence. It commences, then there will be some time lag, there will be some time period after which tribunal will come into existence. I will appoint my arbitrator, you will appoint your arbitrator. The appointed arbitrators may appoint the third arbitrator. There may be a dispute, we may go to section 11 before the Supreme Court or High Court as the case may be. So, it will take some time before the tribunal comes into existence. Once tribunal comes into existence, you can request the tribunal to kindly pass an interim measure so that the subject matter of the dispute is not disposed of. I apprehend that the respondent is likely to dispose of the subject matter. If he disposes of the subject matter, even if I win the case, I will not be in a position to enforce the award because the subject matter will not be there against which I will enforce the award. 
So once the tribunal comes into existence, I can request the tribunal to pass an interim measure. Under section 17, now after the amendment, tribunal can pass very meaningful interim orders. And I may get the relief. But what if the respondent, the other party is disposing of the subject matter before the tribunal has come into existence? The arbitration has commenced. Tribunal has not come into existence. Now, during this period, if the other party is disposing of the subject matter or removing the subject matter away from the jurisdiction of the court, then what is the remedy with me? This is one stage. The other stage is before the commencement itself. The dispute arose before I could write any notice to the opposite party. The opposite party contemplated that there may be arbitration. He starts disposing of the subject matter immediately. What is the remedy? In both these cases, section 9 can be used. Section 9 talks about power of the court to pass interim measure. And we will discuss in, the, in our next lecture that 9 can be invoked even before commencement of arbitration. So that is one remedy which I have. But it is always wise to keep judicial intervention at minimum possible level. It is one of the principles that if you want arbitration to move smoothly, efficiently, then it is good that court intervention is kept at minimum possible level. A party may not like to go to court and get everything delayed. So is there any alternative to section 9? for a period when there is no arbitral tribunal in existence. The alternative is emergency arbitrator proceeding. The alternative is emergency arbitrator proceeding. It is a procedure which provides solution to a party who is not in a position to wait for the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. The party may feel aggrieved and may apprehend that the other party may dispose of the subject matter and I cannot wait for constitution of arbitral tribunal. I need some relief and there lies the importance of emergency arbitrator proceeding. We can request some institution to appoint an emergency arbitrator. That emergency arbitrator will come into picture only for the purposes of answering that emergency situation. He passes an order. That order can be tomorrow reviewed by the full tribunal which comes into existence. Ultimately, a tribunal will come into existence and decide the case. That tribunal can revisit whatever the emergency arbitrator has decided. And this is not something which is new to us. In the, in the year 1990, something called as pre-arbitral relief came into existence by way of ICC rules. International Chamber of Commerce rules of 1990 provided for pre-arbitral referee procedure. Pre-arbitral referee procedure. Parties could apply for a referee for urgent provisional measures. And once tribunal comes into existence, that tribunal will re-examine the decision taken by the referee on that urgent issue. So the whole idea of emergency arbitrator proceeding is to provide some relief for a period when the tribunal has not come into existence, within which there is a likelihood that the subject matter may be disposed of, there may be a damage which is irreparable. So to avoid that irreparable loss, some emergency arbitrator may be appointed to give some relief. There are various arbitral institutions in India which in their rules provide for emergency arbitrator proceeding. For example, rules of Indian Council of Arbitration provides for appointment of emergency arbitrators. Delhi International Arbitration Center, in its rules of 2018, Delhi International Arbitration Center Arbitration Proceeding Rules 2018 also provides for it. 
or award of an emergency arbitrator shall be enforceable in the manner as provided in the act. Listen to me carefully. What the rules of 2018 of the Delhi International Arbitration Center says? It says an award or award of an emergency arbitrator shall be enforceable in the manner as provided in the act. So any decision passed by an emergency arbitrator is given the status of an award. And once it is given the status of an award, it is enforceable like any other award. Use of the word award is significant here. Mumbai Center for International Arbitration in its rules define award as an award includes a partial or final award and award of an emergency arbitrator. So, the decision passed by an emergency arbitrator according to rules of Mumbai Center, Center for International Arbitration. A decision passed by emergency arbitrator is considered as an award. Now, on similar lines, because Indian institutions provide for emergency arbitrator proceeding, Indian institutions consider the decisions passed by emergency arbitrator as award. So, on this line of institutional rules, the Law Commission of India recommended some modifications to be done in the definition of arbitral tribunal in section 2D. They proposed the definition in place of existing 2D. They gave a new definition to the term arbitral tribunal and this is in line with what institutional rules, whatever institutional rules I refer to. According to Law Commission of India, this should be the definition of arbitral tribunal. Arbitral tribunal means a sole arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators. This is there. This is already there in the present 2D. Arbitral tribunal means a sole arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators. And now here you have the emergency arbitrator. And in the case of an arbitration conducted under the rules of an institution which provide for appointment of emergency arbitrators, the definition will also include emergency arbitrator. So, arbitral tribunal means what? A sole arbitrator. Arbitral tribunal means panel of arbitrators. It means sole arbitrator, panel of arbitrators and it also includes emergency arbitrator. This is included in case you are doing your arbitration according to some institutional rules. So, there are institutions which provide for such a mechanism, emergency arbitrator proceeding. The institutional rules, as I mentioned, consider the decisions passed by emergency arbitrator as award. And taking hint from these institutional rules, the law commission suggested that the definition of arbitral tribunal be modified. We had the definition that arbitral tribunal means a sole arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators. Now what is to be added is in case you are doing your arbitration according to institutional rules and suppose that institutional rule provides for emergency arbitrator, then in that case arbitral tribunal will also include an emergency arbitrator. I hope it is clear. So this was a very clear opinion. But unfortunately, this recommendation was not included and therefore emergency arbitrator proceeding could not find place in our Act of 1996. Again in the year 2017, the high level committee to review the institutionalization of arbitration mechanism in India, a high level committee was constituted and that high level committee recommended changes in section 21c as well as section 21d. Section 21c defines the term award. The high level committee recommended that emergency award be added in the definition of award. And the committee also recommended that meaning of arbitral tribunal be modified. And the definition given by the committee is same as the one given by the Law Commission of India. Arbitral tribunal shall mean sole arbitrator, 
arbitral tribunal shall mean panel of arbitrators and in case arbitration is done by FR institutional rules which provide for appointment of emergency arbitrator then in that case arbitral tribunal shall also include emergency arbitrator. So changes were recommended in section 21c to include emergency award within the definition of award. Change was recommended in 21d to include emergency arbitrator within the definition of arbitral tribunal. But unfortunately, again, this, this recommendation of high-powered committee was also not included in the act. So there were two attempts to include the concept of emergency arbitrator within the scope of our act. But on both these occasions, parliament preferred not to include it. Then in 2021, a case was decided called as Amazon versus Future. In this case, what happened was, between these two parties, arbitration was initiated. And arbitration was initiated under the rules of Singapore International Arbitration Center, SIAC. The applicable rules were rules of SIAC. Seat of arbitration is New Delhi. Now, an emergency award was passed in the year 2020. And it was not complied with. Because the emergency award was not complied with, proceeding was initiated in Delhi High Court to enforce the emergency award. And mind, we do not have anything in 21C or 21D which talks about emergency award or emergency arbitrator. These are not included in our statute. So an emergency award was passed by a tribunal with its seat in New Delhi. This was not complied with. Proceeding was initiated in Delhi High Court to enforce the emergency award. A single judge of Delhi High Court recognized that emergency award, but its enforcement was stayed by the division bench. Supreme Court stated that the emergency award is not a nullity and it is enforceable under Section 17 of the Act. Court says that sections 26, 28, and 19.2, mind, you will have to read these provisions once I complete my lecture. Sections 26, 28, and 19.2 of the Act give procedural autonomy to the parties to choose any procedural law for their case. This includes the freedom to the parties to designate institutional rules also. It does not say that when parties designate institutional rules, they must exclude application of provision which deals with emergency award. So when parties are designating institutional rules and suppose those rules talk about emergency award, that provision is part of their designated rule. And the party autonomy is unconditional. The only condition is that your designation, the rules which you adopt for yourself, must not conflict with the mandatory provision of this Act. There is no provision anywhere which prohibits emergency arbitrator or emergency award. So therefore, referring to or adopting an institutional rule which provides for emergency arbitrator proceeding is not in violation of any of the provisions of this act and therefore it is permissible. Section 21D may not use emergency arbitrator proceeding. The definition of arbitral tribunal may not use the term emergency arbitrator. But because the definition is contextual unless the context otherwise requires. Section 2 in the beginning says unless the context otherwise requires, this is the definition. In this case, the context requires you to read some other definition because you are adopting rules which provide for emergency arbitrator. Section 17 says that the relief is available only during the proceedings. Proceedings commence, tribunal comes into existence at a later point of time. During this period, what is the option? Section 17 has assured you that you will get some relief throughout the proceedings. So what kind of relief is possible here? The only possible relief is emergency award. 
that also justifies the possibility of emergency award. There are benefits of emergency arbitration. For example, court system will be relieved from congestion of cases. Parties get urgent interim relief. There is one important point which we have to keep in mind. Emergency award according to Supreme Court in Amazon versus Future Group is enforceable and it is enforceable under Section 17 because Section 17 falls in Part 1 because Section 17 relates only to India seated arbitration. So therefore only India seated emergency awards are enforceable. And as of now, even after the judgment of Supreme Court, the fact remains that only India seated emergency awards are enforceable. An award passed in an arbitration situated outside India is not enforceable. So in this lecture, I think you have understood two sections, section 16 and section 17. Since I said there is nothing like section 17 in part 2 of the act, I mentioned that foreign seated emergency awards are not enforceable in India. So in case foreign seated emergency awards are not enforceable in India, the only option we have is to refer to section 9. The next lecture shall be on section 9. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. <laughs>